Hello, my name is Father Paul Wickens. I'm a Roman Catholic priest, and um, I was ordained in 1955. You know, there's been a lot of changes in the church uh, since that time. Matter of fact, most of the changes came in about 10 years after I was ordained in 1955. They really began in earnest in 1965. Following the close of the Vatican Council, there was a council called in Rome of all the bishops and the idea of the council was to reaffirm Catholic faith. And uh, that was the intention of the bishops and the cardinals and so forth. But somehow or other, they began to make, after the council was over, not so much during the council, a lot of the movers and shakers who got onto various committees and they began to implement, that was the term they used, implement the uh, council. A lot of changes came into the church. And these changes at first seemed to be superficial. Uh, for example, the use of lectors, instead of the priest simply reading the epistle and the gospel, the priest would read the gospel, but a layman would read the epistle. It doesn't seem like much of a change. People were bringing up the gifts, that is, the bread and wine. So these, these changes in the Mass were, were, were small. They were, they were insignificant, seemingly, anyway. <clears throat> and then parts of the Mass were put into the vernacular that is the language of the country. So in America, obviously, parts of the Mass were put into English. If you were in France, they would be in French. If you were in South America, they would be in Spanish or Brazilian. Uh, but the Mass remained in Latin and the Mass remained integral. But then in the late 1960s, 1969, 1970, a completely new Mass came in with a lot of changes, and from that time on, we have saw a tremendous decline in the vital signs of the Catholic Church. Uh, every place uh, that you go, you see a decline since that time. So we're bringing you this program from St. Anthony of Padua Chapel, which has maintained the traditional Catholic faith, traditional Catholic Mass, the Latin Mass, and all the integrity of doctrine and morals that the church has always taught, and which was taught at the time that I was ordained in 1955, but of course many decades and centuries before that. <clears throat> we're, tr we're trying to preserve the faith because this decline has just uh, been catastrophic. Uh, Jesus Christ our Lord said, by their fruits you shall know them. So these changes have only brought, brought bad fruits. We've seen seminaries uh, closing, uh, not just one or two, many seminaries, novitiates have closed, convents are practically empty, there's hardly any candidates to the um, religious life, hardly any. There, there was in 1960, I think, something like 48,000 seminarians, and now as we speak, there's probably less than 10,000. And of those 10,000, many have come into the seminaries because of uh, reduced requirements. They're coming in older, and uh, some of these fellows have been in the world for 20, 30 years, and then in their 40s and 50s uh, have come into the priesthood. Uh, so it's definitely a decline. It's, it's, it, in every way, there's much more divorce than there's ever been. Um, I used to be in a parish in Orange, New Jersey. Now I'm in West Orange, New Jersey, and <clears throat> I was in Orange, New Jersey in the, you might say, the good old days. And we had a school and a hospital, and we had a lot of activity there. And if I meet some of those young people today, who I haven't seen since, let's say, 1965 or 1970, invariably they're separated or divorced. I mean, the, the amount of uh, young people who are not staying with their marriage vows is phenomenal. This all happened after all these changes came into the church. <clears throat> Many, many more changes than that. I'm just giving you a sampling of it. And there's been an increase of selfishness. Uh, just ask any of the, the parents and grandparents. <clears throat> just don't have that sense of um, devotion, a lot of their young people. There are still some good young people. And those who are acting selfish, in a sense, I don't blame them because they have not been given the example of the great saints and the example of Jesus Christ. There's so much talk about self-fulfillment and finding your own happiness. Now these things will come along, finding happiness and fulfillment, but not if we approach them directly. If you directly say, I'm going to do God's will, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, 
We say that in the Lord's Prayer. God's will be done. May, God's will, may, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we pursue that, which is the purpose of life, we'll have a degree of self-fulfillment and a degree of happiness, not perfectly, because we're in an imperfect world, but eventually, <clears throat> if we die in the state of grace, we'll have complete happiness in the next life. So the changes have not really been good. So the purpose of our chapel in West Orange, which is named after the great St. Anthony of Padua, is to preserve the Catholic faith. That we're not the only chapel doing this. There's many uh, priests and uh, and there's many churches and chapels throughout America. There's probably about three or four hundred. Of course, it's, it's only a small percentage compared with all the parishes in the diocese and so forth. But that's our goal, and that's what we, we know is the will of God, is to preserve the Catholic faith. So we're going to come to you on a regular basis, we hope, God willing, and to bring you traditional, solid Catholic teaching for your own salvation, for the salvation of your children and grandchildren and your relatives. This is the doctrine and morals that, have, that has been given to us by Jesus Christ <clears throat> and given to the apostles and preserved all through the centuries. And all these changes over the last 30 years, most of the changes have been detrimental because little by little they erode this doctrine and they erode this morality. Now the way these changes came about, and I don't want to focus too much time on them, is kind of in a gradual way. The expression of doctrine was changed. For example, one of the doctrines of the Catholic Church is that Jesus Christ at the Last Supper, I'll bow my head when I say Jesus Christ at the Last Supper, he took bread and wine and he said, this is my body, this is my blood. And at that moment, the, the substance of the bread and the substance of the wine was changed into the substance of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. A tremendous miracle that actually Christ who is God would become our food and drink. And then he gave the apostles, who were his first priests, the power to do the same thing. So that's what we call transubstantiation. And the church has always held that from the beginning, that duly ordained priests, when they offer up the holy sacrifice of the Mass properly and with the proper intention, that they will uh, perform that miracle, that Christ will become present under the appearance of bread and wine. And we call that transubstantiation. See, substantiation means substance, trans means crossover. So the substance of the bread tr crosses over to the substance of the body and blood of Christ. So that's a doctrine of the church. And it was eventually declared an absolute infallible doctrine <clears throat> at the Council of Trent in the 1500s. There was a great upheaval in Europe, in England and Germany especially, in the early 1500s. And many, many Catholics had left the faith and were getting confused about the faith. So the church called together in Trent, which is a town in northern Italy. Whenever you hear of a council in the church, they name it after the location of the council. So we mentioned earlier in the program about the Vatican Council because it was held in the Vatican. But not all councils were held in the Vatican. There was one held in a town <clears throat> in northern Italy called Trent. And that's, that was a famous council. It lasted. 19 years, uh, at least parts of 19 years, the bishops did not stay in Trent for 19 years, but over a few months out of each year, they stayed in Trent. And during that time, under the guidance of the papal authority, they defined many doctrines. They declared infallibly many doctrines, and one of them was transubstantiation. Okay, so the movers and changers in the church after Vatican II, they saw their opening, they saw a crack in the door, and they came in. <clears throat> and they wanted to change that, but they couldn't change it directly. So they began to get on liturgical committees and change the expression of transubstantiation. See, if transubstantiation means you believe, as I do, and most of you listeners who are Catholic believe, at least you did or should, that Jesus Christ, who is God, is present under the appearance of bread and wine. He's got, and he is to be worshipped and adored and obeyed. Now the, the agents of change could not directly attack transubstantiation, so they changed the expression of transubstantiation. So they, they had people 
stand instead of kneel. See, because you kneel before God and you stand before man. They removed the altar rails. See, they took away patents. They had people receiving communion in the hand. In other words, little by little, the faithful got the impression that this was not any extraordinary bread and wine. That this was just ordinary wine and maybe Christ is present in some symbolic way. And as a matter of fact, uh, the priest himself, and uh, I've said mass in the old way, in the new way, and then I went back to the old way, we used to purify our fingers and purify the chalice and the patent. That's not done anymore in the new mass. Be why did we purify the patents in our fingers? Because we touched the sacred species. And this was Jesus Christ who was God. So these changes were not done directly, but they were done indirectly. And that was a subtle thing about it. So before you know it, over a period of time, you notice that your children don't believe in transubstantiation, even though no one ever got up in the pulpit and denied it. But what they changed and denied was the standard uh, expression of transubstantiation. They changed the customs. And pretty soon, the essence that supported the customs began to disappear. I'll give you a parallel on that. Like, I know many people today are, uh, have seen a revival of nationalism, okay? <clears throat> I'll give you an example of, of Irish nationalism. Uh, over a period of time, people have began to join Irish American groups, and the St. Patrick's Day parade has become very big, and Irish entertainment, and all that's well and good. I'm not commenting whether that's good or bad. It's, nationalism certainly has a place. And let's say, suppose, uh, some agent of change came along, or a committee, and they said, you know, we're all proud that we're Irish, <clears throat> but why do we need the shamrock? You don't need the shamrock. Why don't we just remove the shamrock? And uh, let's put in something else. Let's put in a uh, petunia, <laughs> something, you know. And um, okay, why not? I mean, you don't need the shamrock to, to be proud of your heritage, to be proud of your parents who were born in the Emerald Isle. You don't need the shamrock. You're right, let's use the petunia, okay. And we don't need Danny Boy anymore. Let's put in different music. How about Michael Row the Boat Ashore? Let's change the music of Danny Boy, you know. Corned beef and cabbage, forget about it. We don't want our lamb stew. We don't want any of these traditional, our scone, you know, the Irish bread, which we all love. Well, let's not have that. Let's have whole wheat rolls instead of that, you see. Because none of those things are really what make you Irish. They're only simply expressions, and they can be changed. Well, if you did that, my friends, if you did that, if you were Irish, you belong to an Irish-American group, and you're pretty proud of your heritage, which you should be. Uh, it's certainly the Isle of Saints and Scholars and has produced many great saints for the church and has kept the faith alive, the Catholic faith, over many centuries of persecution. So you're proud of that, and you should be. But if you allowed anyone to start removing these expressions and symbols of your Irishness, pretty soon your Irish pride would disappear. See, and that's really what happened in the, in the church with all these changes. We had pride and reverence towards the Holy Eucharist. <clears throat> we genuflected, we had holy hours, we had benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. <clears throat> and the agents of change said, no, you can still believe in the Blessed Sacrament, but you don't have to kneel, you don't have to fold your hands, you don't have to receive on the tongue, you don't have to have the tabernacle in the center. See, they, they made all these changes, but little by little, and they knew it, they would erode your faith so that you, you, you no longer believed in transubstantiation, that you no, no longer believed in the Blessed Sacrament as the church has always taught. And they did that little by little. And of course, <clears throat> you wonder how that can happen uh, because after all, we have bishops, we have a pope, we have cardinals, we have heads of religious orders. How could it happen? Because see, most people uh, even among priests and bishops and cardinals, most people uh, don't want trouble. They don't want to fight with anybody. You see this happen with parents all the time. You know, you have teenagers and they're keeping bad hours, uh, coming home two, three in the morning and they're associating with uh, people that you're not happy with because you know these other people I engage in illicit drugs and or drink too much, the old six-pack mentality. So you don't really like it, plus fornication may be going on. 
and they don't go to mass and they don't say the rosary and they don't go to confession so you're not really happy about your teenage boys and girls associating with them so it means that every day you have to sort of fight with them you know that's the way it is human nature is prone towards weakness you have to kind of fight with them you know i mean we fight with kids in a in a in a nice sense you're not having a fist fight but even on non-moral things, you say, look, uh, you got to hang up your coat. Every time you come in, you throw your coat on the, on the chair. you got to hang it up. You have to tell them over and over again, hey, you got to do your homework. Or you got to get up on time. You're late all the time. I had a wedding yesterday <clears throat> in my chapel, and it was scheduled for 3.30, and the bride showed up at quarter after 4. <laughs> Talk about being late, you know. So I'm not judging this young lady, and I didn't want to make her wedding day unhappy. She had no good reason, except she just fussed and fussed and fussed and uh, fixed her hair again and whatever she did. I don't know what she was doing, but she didn't show up till quarter after, and, and the whole church was waiting, and um, we knew she was coming, so it wasn't that she was going to leave the groom at the altar. <clears throat> but possibly over a period of time, her, her parents did not insist, insist, you must be on time, because... You know, this is a television program, and if you look at commercials on television, they repeat things over and over again because they know human nature needs that. You have to tell people over and over again, you know, because you tell them once, it's not enough. You tell your children once, and it's not enough. You have to remind them over and over because human nature is weak. At least generally it's weak, and some people are stronger than others. We know that. But anyway, to, to draw uh, the uh, parallel, we have priests and bishops and nuns and heads of religious orders. And uh, <clears throat> so liturgists come along and they make these changes. Well, you don't like the changes. I didn't like the changes. But if I tried to argue with it, it would, be, it would disturb my peace of soul. It would disturb harmony in the rectory. It would, dis it would make harmony in the diocese. So you kind of let it go. Just like... Uh, you want to have a peaceful home, so you kind of let, the, let it go with the kids. You, but you shouldn't do that. You, you love them, and you want what's best for them, and you know that you have to stick with right and principle regardless. And, uh, and that's the same in the church. So uh, priests that I know, some of us anyway, knew that we could see a, a gradual lessening of devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, and we resisted it. I know that I would not give communion in the hand. I felt that was the last straw. And, uh, but most of us padres, and I'm not knocking anybody else, and uh, I'm not a saint. Right in back of us, in uh, the backdrop, we have Saint Anne, by the way, and the Blessed Mother. As a little child, and here on our uh, table here, we have an image of the Blessed Mother. So we're not saints yet or anything like that. <clears throat> But we have to do our best to, to try to uphold and keep the Catholic faith and Catholic tradition because it's not simply cultural or, it's a, or, or nostalgia. It's a matter of truth, and truth comes from God. And uh, our Lord said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So love cannot simply just be an emotional thing. And if you say you love your children, it's not simply emotional or affection. Sure, you give them a hug and a kiss. But what's even more important for the kids is that you direct them on the path of what is good and warn them of what is not good for them. I mean, if your child was playing on the edge of a cliff, would you say, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings or I don't want them not to love me? Uh, you would go out and you'd say, get away from that cliff. And let's say, suppose they didn't come away from the cliff. And we'd say, well, I tried, I spoke. No, you'd run over, you'd grab them, and you'd pull them back, you know, and you'd whack them. And they'd say, you don't love me, you don't love me, you're not. And see, because when you're young and uninformed and in inexperienced, you think if your parents contradict you, they don't love you, and then no one loves you more than your parents. Nobody, absolutely. I was talking the other day to uh, one of my sisters. I happen to be from a large family. My parents had nine children. And one of my sisters, who's well married, she's been married for many, many years, her kids are grown up, and they have children. And we were talking about mom and dad, and she said, you know, my relationship to mom changed after I had my first baby. Up to that time, I always thought, well, you know, my mother and my father, they're always restraining me or being negative, you know, and they're trying to control me. These are the words they use today, you know, and the, 
in the modern parlance to denigrate parental supervision. They use the word control like it's something tyrannical. I'll have to talk a little bit about that at some time, about the tyranny of language, the tyranny of words, you know. Parental love and parental affection and parental direction and discipline, parental teaching. And uh, sometimes uh, this is uh, construed to be harmful to us, but we don't know any better. It's good for us, you know. I remember Bill Cosby one time uh, was talking, uh, he was doing an interview, Bill Cosby, the comedian, and uh, he, he's married and has children, and um, his children would say to him, don't preach to me, don't preach to me, Pop, you know. He would say, I'm not preaching to you, I'm giving you wisdom, wisdom, what's good for you, what's wise for you. And we don't always realize that uh, when we're going through adolescent years and sometimes in our young 20s until we become parents. And then we look back and say, my mother and father did, did what I'm doing for my baby and they did it for six, seven, eight babies. What a debt of gratitude I have for my parents. I could never, now I know, now I understand, you know. And this is also true of the changes in the church, like a traditional priest like myself, I kind of went along with the title a little bit because I didn't want to fight with anybody, you know, and it didn't seem right to me, but they'd always talk me out of it and say, well, no, this is, uh, this is what they want in Rome, or this is what the Vatican Council wants, and it kind of went along with it, and, um, and uh, I had bad vibes about these changes, couldn't put my finger on it because I was busy, you know, I was a hospital chaplain, I was coaching three sports, I had a lot of youth activity, and I had a parish with baptisms and a school, and, and you kind of leave the experts decide on what's right in the liturgy. And, but little by little, by the grace of God, and I guess I have to owe, I owe a lot to the Blessed Mother whose statue we have here in the rosary, because, and the scapular which we wear, because the Blessed Mother kind of keeps an eye out for us. If you ever find a, a padre, a priest, who, who has kind of stayed traditional, uh, you can bet that that particular priest never stopped saying his rosary because his mother, and that's who Mary is, she's our mother, as well as the mother of Christ, she keeps an eye on us, you know, and uh, she protects us. And uh, so these, these, uh, these changes that came along, uh, you, uh, just to draw out the parallel, here's the teenager who doesn't, appreciate what's going on, but then there's an awakening when that teenager gets a little older, gets married, and sees the responsibilities of parenthood. Well, that's the same with uh, a priest who, let's say, goes through all these liberal changes, and uh, he, uh, he doesn't really feel right about it, and then one day he goes to the altar and says the Tridentine Latin Mass. And that's a turnabout. When that happens, uh, a light bulb goes on, uh, an awakening. You say, this is the problem with the decline in the vital statistics in the church. This is the decline. The putting aside of the traditional Latin mass with its clear, loud trumpet of doctrine and morals and reverence, by putting that aside and putting in uh, a substitute, uh, that's why people are getting sick, you know. It's like taking a beautiful meal, it's well balanced, nutrition, vitamins, and putting it aside and then giving them jelly beans and cookies and sweets, you know. It kind of titillates at first, but in the long run it runs the faith down. And that's what I think all these changes were in the church. I know some people will say, well, no, these changes are good. Just check the fruits. And don't let anybody uh, deceive you. The fruits are terrible. There's a tremendous decline of the faith. They've closed churches all over the place in every diocese in the United States. Chicago's closed like 60, Cleveland like 50, Philadelphia like 45. Closing parishes, closing parishes. Oh, they'll try to say it's demographics or whatever they want to tell you. Because people who are these agents of change will not own up to the fact that these changes 
have been very detrimental. So with God's help, uh, our chapel, St. Anthony of Pado, is doing our best to preserve the faith, the true Catholic faith, through the traditional mass, uh, where people will get their spiritual vitamins, uh, the graces, we also as, and also the instructions. Instructions that we'll be using from these uh, traditional uh, religion books, which are the teaching religion books, are called catechism, so we'll be using a catechism. And we see the good example of other people. We see traditional expressions of reverence. We have confession, the sacrament of confession, which has practically disappeared in the, quote, new church, practically disappeared, half hour a week or something. We have lines and lines of people going to confession, admitting before God, I'm a sinner, mea culpa, it's my fault, I need forgiveness. Remember Christ said to the apostles, who sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Who sins you shall retain, they are retained. So he gave his priest the power to forgive sins in his name, of course. And, and of course, Christ wants his followers to use this sacrament to uh, receive absolution and the graces to avoid sin in the future so that it save their soul. So just to uh, cap this up, this program, uh, we're at St. Anthony of Padua Chapel in West Orange. We have the traditional Latin Mass, and you're welcome. You're welcome to write us. Uh, you'll see our address on the graphics and the uh, phone number. You can drop us a line, give us a call. We'll send you directions if, uh, if you're far away from West Orange. But West Orange is not too far from any place in New Jersey, really. Uh, every, every place is within an hour or a half hour, and some place, sometimes a little farther than that, but it's worth it. It's worth it. You want to save your soul and the souls of your children and grandchildren. So please come back to the traditional Catholic faith and, and, um, and persevere in it and bring your friends, too, at the same time. So we hope to be on this uh, station and this program uh, on a regular basis. So in the meantime, uh, we wish you God's blessing. And benedictio Dei, I'm going to give you a Latin blessing. Benedictio Dei omnipotentis patris et filii et spiritus sancti descendit super vos et mani et semper. Amen. God bless you all. Everyone enjoys listening to birds, and now you can bring those happy sounds indoors with the official National Audubon Society Singing Bird Clock. At 12 o'clock, you'll hear the haunting...